have it in a central location in my district to get the feedback from the people that live here and any other members of the public that wanted to give their feedback on the superintendent search that is really kicking into high gear. I, I want to give you a little history of how we got here. Um, right now, we are having these sessions. We're having them at all the high schools across EPISD. So we started last week. This is the last week that we're going to have these listening sessions where each trustee is hosting them at their high school that they represent. So this is kind of the timeline of how we got here. So um, last year, the superintendent resigned in October. We've had an interim superintendent ever since, Vince Sheffield. So for about a year now, we have not had a permanent superintendent at EPISD. So we started the process to hire a, a search firm, something that I did not vote for, but it ended up being, I got outvoted. So the reason I didn't vote for that is because I didn't see the value of search firms, especially in the, in the quality of candidates that they bring. Um, just heard a lot of horror stories from across the country where search firms are just not ideal. I got outvoted. The board hired a search firm on March 30th. And then um, from May 17th to June 7th, we had 26 virtual community meetings with the search firm at the time, the Texas Association of School Boards. And then we also had online surveys that were conducted by TASB. So then we, we get a message um, through the summer months that there's a potential conflict of interest with the search firm and they decided that um, they wanted to let us know that this was a, a conflict and in August we decided to end our agreement with the search firm. So what ended up happening there is the search firm gave us the surveys that had already been compiled. So we didn't have to start at square one. So we got the surveys, we got the virtual communities done and that search firm was not, did not charge us for that. So we ended that agreement. So then um, we hired this search firm, Walsh Gallegos, and they started the process with us. Again, I voted against the second search firm as well, but there are some good things that can come out of this search firm. I think one is that they come with a law firm attached, so that is really good in the sense that we are going to be able to have the contracts sent to the finalists and say, hey, um, this is the contract that the board wants to offer, what do you think? Before we get into contract negotiations, I think that was the one good thing that was offered by the search firm. So I'm looking forward to that. And right now, um, we each ended up talking to the search firm. We had one-on-one -on -one phone calls. I talked to the search firm for about two and a half hours. Uh, it was a one hour call, but I've extended it to two and a half hours. And the whole point of my call was for me to explain how we got here, the history of the district, the public corruption scandal that rocked the district in the past decade, um, the closure of schools. All of those things were in my conversation with the search firm. I thought that was important so we could give the search firm context on how we got here today. And then, um, the, the actual application was posted online through Texas ISD and TASANET, two websites that are just really common for superintendent searches. You go on there, the application was very, very uh, basic. It was, you know, we got together as a board and we decided that we wanted um, a doctorate to be a preferred thing for our superintendent, not a requirement. Bilingual preferred, um, we want somebody that has superintendent experience, so somebody that has been a sitting superintendent. Um, that's something that we're really strong about. And then um, we went to the Texas Association of School Boards um, conference that they have every year. We were in Dallas, and we did that um, toward the end of September. We also had the search firm there, where they were, they had a booth, and people came by and talked to them. And then now, we're, um, we're here where um, we are in the, I guess the middle, I would call this the middle, but the middle's gonna get us to the end very fast in the next six weeks. 
And so this is kind of what we did um, with our virtual meetings. That there was 26 of them, right? So we talked to elementary teachers. We talked to the student advisory council on May 26. We had three sessions with principals. We had community and business leaders in one session on June 1st. Middle school teachers had four sessions. And then we talked to the teachers association, um, two of the teachers associations um, on June 4th. And then we also talked to high school teachers. So it was a total of 26 um, Zoom virtual meetings. And then we also had a survey that was online throughout the course of May and June. So there was about a thousand people that responded to the online survey, and then about half of those, 537, were from community members and from parents. So how, continuing with how we got here, right? So um, we, we decided that we had intersection the first two weeks of October, so we said, okay, we're gonna have these community meetings the last two weeks of October. Why are we having them the last two weeks of October? Because next Tuesday, we are gonna meet as a board at 9 a.m. And we are gonna review applications. It's the first time that we're gonna see the applications. We're gonna sit with them and we're gonna discuss them pretty much all day. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but I mean, I don't know if it's gonna be nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven. But we are setting that up so we're there all day and we come up with however, however many people we want to interview. So that's going to be a really important date. So then after we meet on that Tuesday, this is where I'm saying that it's just going to go really, really fast. We are going to have meetings on November 8th, 9th, and 10th to interview the candidates. So then a week later, November 15th and 16th, there is going to be a potential second interview depending on what direction the board wants to take. And we will um, possibly take action on that day. In mid-November, we might have action to say, okay, we have a finalist. It is likely going to be um, one person. My ideal scenario is having three finalists come meet, the community comes and meets them. But again, guidance and just the way the superintendent searches kind of work preclude us from doing something like that because there's gonna be, out of three finalists, let's say we have three finalists, two are not gonna get the job. So then they might risk their job wherever they're at at that point. So that's why they don't want it. And so again, I wanted the community to be involved as much as possible, I think, we have done our due diligence in the sense of offering something virtual, offering surveys, having these community meetings, and then taking this information and having it in closed session next week, right? So I attended two of the meetings last week. I'm here today. I'll probably attend another two meetings just to hear what the whole community has. That way, I'm that voice when I'm there and saying, you know what, at this meeting, I heard that this person said this we need to include that. So that's the importance of these meetings and I really thank you for being here today. And then um, on December 6th or 7th, we will likely have a hire because we have to have a 21 day waiting period on when we announce finals. It's the law, it's what we need to do. And then they, they would probably start sometime in the spring just again, it depends on what that person is doing. They might ask to finish the school year wherever they are. Um, so there's not an exact date on when they will start, but there is an exact date on when we are gonna finish, and that's gonna be in the next six weeks. So it's gonna go by really fast, and it's gonna be high energy, and we're, we're ready to take it. So that kind of illustrates the process. I, I really want to give you a good timeline. I, I wanted to make sure that the community could be included as much as possible uh, because I don't like making decisions by myself and I really want to hear from you. And so the one thing about this meeting is this question. So what would you like to see in the ideal superintendent for El Paso Independent School District? So at this point, what I want to do is just pass the microphone around. If you have a comment, 
then um, answer this question or anything else. Let me know. If you don't want um, to speak, just pass the microphone on to somebody else. I would like to see someone local, you know, stop bringing people from the outside who may not have a body into our community. I echo that, and I think um, clearly, uh, I realize that your position on using a search firm, you know, um, you weren't able to convince the, the school board or the district to, to go otherwise, but it seems to me that we need a, a real shift in paradigm in terms of finding you know, somebody to lead the district. Uh, what I've seen uh, happen across the city, not just the UPISD, is um, this sort of notion that you're going to hire a superstar that comes from out of the city, somebody who's going to be sort of a silver bullet, somebody's going to come in and solve the district's problems with fanfare and, and new concepts and new ideas and, and what we need is somebody who's, who's got empathy for our community, for our kids, somebody who's going to be accountable, somebody who's authentic, somebody who's got skin in the game, somebody who at the end of the day when they do something bad, they've got something to lose here because they, uh, they came up through our, our city, they've got friends, family, maybe their kids, you know, are, are part of the district. Um, but somebody who, at the end of the day, is has got something to lose if they don't do a good job. Because so far, the only people that are losing are, are the kids. When people get shifted, you know, put to a turnstile, and, and, and our district is just a, a, a trampoline for people to go somewhere else.
What do you mean? I'd like to also um, reiterate what the gentleman and Ms. Becky said. I just want a superintendent who, once he or she gets hired, they will take action, you know, and be, re and be accountable for, for the action that they take. You know, and also, like Ms. Becky said, on um, the principals. We hired the principals because that's what we wanted them to do and the principals have a job to do. But we also want a superintendent who is gonna to listen to the principals and have their back, like, like, like they say. So that's what I want, you know, the, the superintendent to have accountability for their actions and to be able to say, you know what, we messed up, you know what, I'm the superintendent, I will be held accountable because this is a job that I was put forth to do and this is what I'm gonna do. We would like to see a superintendent who has an open door policy, uh, who's willing to go out into the schools and work with the teachers, and also be available to the community for them to go able to, to talk to him and, or her and uh, discuss any issues or concerns that they may have um, if they don't get any satisfaction on their way. Good evening. I basically would like to tell you what we don't want to see in a superintendent. Somebody from out of town that will come and play us all and it costs more to uh, give them their millions and be having to sue us when they uh, steal money from the district and we lose even more. Um, I think that the district has enough qualified individuals up there at central office that are knowledgeable enough to run the district the right way. Um, and, you know, we, like the gentleman said, someone who has vested in the, in, in the community and that has something to lose, yes. wouldn't be able to open. 
wouldn't be able to feed kids, wouldn't be, you know, so it takes, it takes a village. So we need to have a superintendent that understands and is local. Is there anybody else who wants to say anything? Okay, so I took notes and I just kind of wanted to give you a little bit more information on, on some stuff that was said, right? I think it's really sad that we have to say somebody with integrity, somebody with ethics, somebody that's transparent. We shouldn't have to say that, right? It, it's implied, it just comes with it. That's what leadership should be doing. But I think we all as a community have that collective trauma from what's happened with the past two superintendents at EPISC, right? One went to jail, one was involved in a lawsuit that is still not been resolved. And, and those are the types of things that we have seen in this community. I, I can't think back, I mean, I, I can think back maybe 20 years, and I don't think there's been somebody that has had that whole leadership that EPISC has needed. Um, and, and that's why I'm hoping that we get this right. I, I do see that um, there are politics, unfortunately, that I wish weren't there. There are outside forces that are trying to influence this process. And I hope at the end of it, we come out with a good superintendent that will take us to the next chapter of EPISD. I, I think um, the contract is something that is really important to me just because I have seen how detrimental that contract has been to the taxpayer. So there was a $1,200 allowance for home office that was for the cell phone in the last contract. There was a $1,500 car allowance in there. I feel like those things don't belong in a superintendent's contract. That contract was such a great contract that the board of managers put in for Juan Cabrera when he got to the district. And if you add up just those two perks, it was another $30,000 a year added to that contract. So that is really important to me. I want to make sure that in the contract, there is not going to be an ability for the superintendent to say, I'll get evaluated when I get evaluated. There, there was that power in that contract. We, we shifted the, the annual contract from January because there were, can't talk about it, it was executive session, but we, we postponed it. But at that time, this was around January 2020, right before the pandemic, the superintendent had to agree to when he was going to get evaluated since we postponed it. That's insane. <laughs> I think we all have jobs and they tell us, okay, your evaluation's up. We're, we're not in a position to say, I'm not getting evaluated for X reason. Like you get evaluated when you get evaluated, right? So those things are really important to me. Uh, from El Paso, also that committee is really, really important to me. I don't know if we're gonna end up there, but that is a, a priority that I'm gonna fight for going in. Uh, I know there are probably a lot of people that are outside of El Paso, from El Paso, that wanna come back to El Paso, right? So I'm hoping we'll be in that ideal scenario where we find somebody that does want to come back to El Paso that has that understanding of our community because it is important to me. And also I want to see about those big payouts that come in the contract. Um, I know that that we had to pay $558,000. I got dragged through the mud for it, but at the time I thought it was what we could do best because if we continued under that route and we didn't accept that resignation, it was going to be more detrimental to the, the district. So I had to bite the bullet on that one, but I'm hoping that we do get a contract that's not going to put this board or the future board in a position to have to do that again. Um, as far as bringing accountability to the entire process, I mean, I, I think I've reached a point where I'm exhausted of having to clean up so much. I, I just want to focus on other things that are not cleaning up or finding little things that are here in the district that I have no idea where that. Two things that that I think um, I realized within the past year, last November they came to us with um, 
with buckets. They're called pull-ups. And the best way to explain them was really difficult to learn. Because it was just, I really had to dig deep until I finally understood it. The easiest way to explain it is, it's these buckets. So let's say we put in $4 million in this bucket. And if you use it for office supplies, as a board, I don't think it's my duty to say, how many markers does Austin High School have? I really don't care at that point, right? Those, those things are, that's too much oversight, I think, in the board. So to use those co-ops, those buckets for office supplies makes sense. You don't have to bid out every marker. You don't have to bid out every crayon that's going to be used. You just have a list of selected vendors, Office Depot, House Office um, products. These are all pre-approved. You can get them. So, but what the superintendent was doing is basically coming to the board and using this as a blank check. And I think that's how a lot of programs got in for technology things that were not going to be evaluated. Um, a lot of programs across the district were used through that, and the board was not being told because it was a little. Um, it was a way for the superintendent to not have to bring that down though. So we're working to reform that. We've been working on that for the past year. And I'm hoping that we improve those processes so they're not abused in the future. And then we are also bringing something back that um, we just found out last week that when DeMargo uh, led the board of managers, uh, they, they took away the power of the board to approve final hires that the superintendent has. So any cabinet member principals that were out there um, to appease the contract, again, going back to the contract, to appease the contract of Juan Cabrera when he signed it in 2013, came to the district, they took away that power from the board. So we're working to restore that power where the board isn't gonna come and say, oh, okay, we, we need a promotion or we're gonna put somebody in principal. The board will have that accountability to say yes, no. The board says no, then the superintendent will have to go back and come to the board with another decision, which I think eliminates that ability to provide that favoritism that was done. I think this adds another step. I don't think it's a, a thing to micromanage. All the other districts are doing it, except for EPI State. And so I think this will bring better accountability to that position. And so I think the, the buckets, eliminating the buckets for those contracts, and, and this will be tools in our arsenal to provide more accountability over the superintendent. And then, yeah, I, I think that's, that kind of covers everything that was said. So I just wanted to give you my thoughts on it. I'm hoping that we're gonna be okay. And uh, we, we do have a very educated board. And I think it's it's a very different board that the district has not seen. I, I, I can't remember this in, in a long time. I mean, it's a very young board. It is a board that has uh, three members, including myself, that have been there for a little over two years. We have a senior member that has been there for over five, six years. Uh, and then we have board members that have been on board for four or five months. And so we're going in there um, where we have one board member that has a master's in education, and then I have a doctor in education, and then you have other board members with masters. So I think that hopefully will, will, will give us some power to get somebody that is adequate for this position, and it's not just who X, Y, and Z people want in the position. So I'm hoping that we'll come back with good news and I don't have to be out there saying this is a bad hire. I really don't want to get to that, that position. But um, as always, I, I have an open door policy. You can reach me anywhere. Um, and let me know if any other thoughts come to mind. And November 2nd is going to be important. Is there anything else that anybody else wanted to say? Yeah. What about the health insurance company's employees? So health insurance. So health insurance is an interesting one, and um, Norma can tell you all about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But right now, we there was a new law that passed, and we are going to see um, if we continue the self-funded or the other one. I forget what the other one's called. But the self-funded has been more economical, and there's been more money in the bucket of our employees. And so I'm, I'm thinking that the district and the board will go in the direction of going in the self-funded. But once we select the self-funded, then we're locked in for a number of years. So that's gonna that 
the, the big thing right now is just seeing how we're going to pay for that money because if we have 8,000 employees, we have to assume that meeting that's coming in November, December, where they're going to see how we put in um, millions of dollars into that fund and then bring it to the board for a final approval so we go in that direction. That's kind of where I want to go because one of the big things when I got on this board was we were locked in into a really horrible insurance and one of the big solutions was bringing the self-funded in. And that's been great for everybody, but now I think we're going to try to make it self-funded for all people because it'll just be cheaper. I think about 80%, I forget the exact number, but I think about 80% are already on the self-funded, so we'll probably continue on that path. And we did approve $2,000 um, bonuses for everybody, stipends um, in, in December and in June. We'll have to approve the June one, the December one's already approved. But that means that every employee, um, it doesn't matter if they're full-time or part-time, they will be getting that $2,000 stipend. Um, that was a big thing that um, I made sure was in, in the whole thing because a lot of our part-time employees are part-time because they can't be full-time. They're the cafeteria workers, they're the bus drivers. In other words, the people that have been on the front lines during this whole pandemic also getting COVID in, in the way and we needed to compensate everybody. So that's something that I'm, I'm proud that the board voted on. And the first stipend will be in December and we'll have to approve the next stipend um, sometime in the spring. But I'm, I'm sure that the board will want to go in that, in that direction as well. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the, the number, sorry, I moved this. So about half of that number, 537 surveys were from community members and parents. And then I'm wondering, is that information public, like uh, for the company, the, what people were asking for? Is that what you would probably share with us? I, I think I could ask to see if they could get some maybe like word cloud or some just common things that, that were said. I don't think they'll actually share the actual surveys themselves, but maybe a list of maybe like a top 10 or something. That, that would be good. I think that's a good idea.